Greetings, everyone. This is Tony Scucci. Uh, I'm the person who will be facilitating this webinar on board self-assessment. Uh, we believe there are seven folks uh, on the connection right now, and I think everyone has been asked to please mute your phone. Um, I also want to invite folks to participate, so when time comes to ask a question, please remember to unmute your phone. You can also type in a question, and if I don't see it, Philip will see it, and Philip can just kind of uh, let me know you have a question and, uh, and let us know what it might be. So again, welcome to everyone. Um, let me just quickly tell you a little bit about myself if you don't know who I am. I, I've, I've worked in the nonprofit world for most of my adult life, um, and I've done a lot of work with, through NACUI and with NACUI over the past four or five years. Worked with um, probably 30 of the urban Indian programs around the country doing board development work and board training. And I've also done some, uh, some planning work with some of those groups as well and also with the National Indian Health Board. So I've kind of been involved with, uh, with the Native community, particularly in terms of health care services for, um, in a fairly intensive way for the past four or five years. Last year, um, in cooperation with NACUI, we developed three webinars on board development, on board training, and we, uh, and we delivered them last summer, I believe, summer of 2011. Those, um, those webinars are archived at the NACUI website. Um, we are currently doing a thir a, the third webinar in a series of six this time around. Ultimately, all those webinars will be archived at the NACUI website. So anytime after uh, today or whenever after each one is presented, you'll be able to have access to that. If you'd like to get that information, share it with your uh, with fellow board members or whoever it might be helpful to you today uh, into the future. Uh, today we're going to talk about board self-assessments. We're going to talk about the what, when, how, and why of doing one. Uh, a lot of the material that I draw on, I just want to credit uh, uh, the sources. They really come from three major sources, uh, one of those being board source. The other is the National Council on Nonprofit Associations. And I also view some material from the main association, the nonprofits, which is my home nonprofit association. I live in Portland, Maine. Um, I also want to encourage you to participate as, as actively as you'd like to on this webinar. There is a relatively small number of folks, so please feel free to make comments or ask questions anywhere along the way. And invite you, again, to draw on your experience and share your stories. Uh, on the screen, you'll see my website, uh, my email, tscucci at prexar.com. After this webinar or any time, uh, if you feel like sending me an email, if you have a question, a comment, if you'd like some resources, um, I would be glad to, uh, to be as helpful to you as I possibly can. Also want to take the time now to thank Philip for being the technical support person here. He's the, he's the key to all this. If it weren't for him, <laughs> I don't know what we'd be doing. Uh, but thank you, Philip, for, for being there and, uh, and being right on top of things for us. Um, what I'd like folks to do is maybe if you could just unmute your phone for a minute and if, Philip, if you can see the list of folks, can you just go down that list and let's just do a quick roll call just to get a sense of who is on the call? Yes, can you hear us? I hear you. <laughs> Why don't you go first and tell us who you are? Sorry about that. <laughs> okay, this is Ernest <laughs> uh, calling from Great Falls, Montana. Hi, Ernest. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Who else is on? We, we have Quatamak Peranda. Yep, that's me, present. And Diana Marshall. Huh? Diane, can you hear us? Well, assuming you're muted, hello, Diane. We have, and we heard from Ernestine, and we have Gina Dressel. Hi, Gina. And can you Gina hear us? has not put in the audio code, so she's probably not able to speak to us, but can hear us. Okay, and if folks have forgotten to do that, Philip, can they still do that now? Yes, um, I send it uh, to, I hit a message and it sends the audio pin to please enter it now. Great. And it tells them that um, over the conference line. And Jennifer Ruiz. Great. Jennifer, can you hear us? Okay, let's hope that you're still muted or you haven't punched in that um, that code number. 
I'm going to just go ahead and and, uh, and jump into this. So I think everyone can see the screen. We're going to look at board self-assessment. And once again, let me remind you, if you have any questions or comments after this presentation, please feel free to reach out to me at that email address. Okay, so we'll look at the goal for today. Uh, and really, this is about trying to get a better understanding of board self-assessments about the process itself and the ways it can really make a difference in, in the way your board performs. And I just want to point out that, that, that at whatever level your board is performing, doing, uh, doing self-assessments uh, in some regular way will, can only be more and more helpful, move you up to a higher level of performance as a board of directors. What we hope to accomplish today, we're going to explore and discuss some of the elements of an effective uh, board self-assessment process. Uh, we're going to frame and answer some questions like, you know, what is a board of self-assessment? Why would you even do one? Um, when is it a good time to do a board self-assessment? That's a question people commonly ask. Um, how does this whole process work? Um, what are the costs? What are the benefits? And, and what are the potential impacts? What are the ways that doing self-assessment can really make a difference? And so I think about laying out this material today and, um, and the agenda would look like a welcome and introductions, which you just did, and an overview. I want to spend a few minutes at the beginning of the session really kind of building a common definition of what it is that we're talking about so we all have a, a common understanding of what this is. We'll look at the why, when, and hows. Then we can look specifically at what are the areas that you would include in a self-assessment. And these areas are really the kind of areas that have they're kind of all the elements that have to do with, uh, with uh, board governance. We'll look at the benefits. We'll look at the obstacles. Uh, it's interesting to me, in fact, that if, if folks can raise their hands, I think there may be a way to do that. But I would ask you to raise your hand. If there's a button somewhere, I think you might see that. It might be a, a hand button of some kind. Uh, if you have done a board self-assessment, on the current board you're on or you're working for, if you would raise your hand and say you have. And I'm not seeing or hearing any hands wave, and my uh, belief then is that it's, no one on the call has really done this in a comprehensive way before. Um, that's not Dressel, surprising. I'm, on. Uh, I'm sorry. This is Gina Dressel. I've now gotten myself on. We're just trying to move towards that. Oh. Well, that's great. I, I was just going to say, Gina, that, that most, many, many boards do not even think about doing this. And, you know, it is a great place to begin if you really want to improve. That simply, you know, take the time to kind of take a look at your organization and take a look at your board. So you just begun that process now? Well, we just met um, going over the, your last session. We just met as a group um, and uh -huh. looked at the last session. And we're going to start self-evaluating every meeting based on your last oh, presentation. Great. And so I'm well, trying I'm to glad. move towards looking at what we're doing. So uh, well, That's great. I'm glad you, you mentioned that too because often people talk about uh, this session is going to be mostly about assessing the board as a, as a whole body, but you can also um, assess individual board members' performances as well. So uh, it, it's, a, it's a good place you're going. I, I commend you for that. Yeah, that's our first step is how do we do at each meeting? So. Well, it is absolutely the first step, and it's the most important one because every step follows. <laughs> That's great. Um, there's some resources in here you'll see as we go along, and then we'll take a few minutes either at the end of this session to evaluate, um, and you will also get a follow-up email from the CUI, uh, which is a brief little uh, survey uh, asking for your feedback about this session. And so please take the time to respond to that. It's quick. It's easy and um, give us your best feedback, honest and direct. We want to hear what worked for you and what didn't. There's also an opportunity in that survey to suggest future topics for trainings that we can do through webinars, so please feel free to kind of jump in and do that. Uh, sir, can I uh, make a comment here? Um, this is Ernestine from sure Great Falls. Yeah, I emailed this out to all the board members. I did get some uh, responses back from two of them. However, I see they're not on it. So this is kind of new for for them too as well to um, mm -hmm. you know been on a live session with you all. So I just wanted to bring that to your attention. 
Well, I, it's a, it's relatively new to me too, and it, there's an awkwardness about doing things this way. It's not like sitting with people, um, right? But it's a it's a good compromise, and uh, you know I think it, um, you know we do our best to make the most of it. I, I'm not sure if anyone on this call w was on previous calls, but I think I mentioned on the last webinar that there were some urban Indian programs where the executive director would, would uh, take time just before a particular board meeting and actually download a webinar and have a little mini training session with her or his board. So that's another way you can use this, uh, these resources. Please feel free to, to be creative and use them in any way that would that that'd be helpful to you. So when we talk about this board self-assessment, and this is a time to unmute your phone, but let's just kind of build a common definition. What, what is your understanding of what, this, what a board self-assessment is? How would you define a board self-assessment? I would say just to see how they're doing. You know, overall, they, they assess us, the executive directors, you know, so you know, I, I would assume, okay, how are we conducting the meeting? Are we following the agenda? Am I on the right track? Oh, it's excellent, yes. And, and you know, a lot of work I do, uh, I work with boards who are evaluating their CEOs, and I make it, uh, make it very clear to them that the performance of your executive director is intimately connected to your performance as a board. It's, it's a real partnership. Um, you know, and so it's, it's good for there to be a two-way street here, I think. So that's terrific. Right. So and it's really I, looking kind of at... Yeah. In addition to these web, webinars, um, this is Ernestine mm -hmm. yet, um, I've, I've um, brought an attorney in that deals in human resources to get an idea, have discussion with them, what their needs might be, and, and um, you know, just get going on it. I know the new IHS manual says we will require eight hours where it was 20 before, so um, that's just a comment, too. Okay. Sure. Uh, one of the one of the reasons that we've instituted these webinars is to make it easier for board members to get some training, um, and so it's um, you know it's just another kind of uh, another approach, um, especially for new board members or, or for organizations where they are budgets are limited and they can't afford to kind of bring in somebody to do trainings. Uh, this is this is a fairly good compromise. And so when we think about this whole board self-assessment, you know, what we're talking about, it's really, as people have said already, it's a first step in a process that there's a reciprocal part to this. You know, the board evaluates the exec, and the exec can, can provide the board with feedback as well. Um, the self-assessment process, I, I use the term assessment uh, in, uh, with intention because this is not about, this is not like taking a test. It's about getting a sense of what your board does well and where your board can make some improvements. So it's an assessment versus like diagnosing some illness. Um, and the thing that I come to find is that until you can really get a clear picture of your board and how it works, you can't begin to improve. The metaphor I think of it's like taking a snapshot. At a one moment in time, you know, you create an accurate picture of where you are as a board. Uh, the camera is the tool. Um, and so, you know, where you point the camera and how you develop the film and how you frame that picture is going to give you some ideas and some insights into how you perform as a board, where you do well, and where you could improve. Um, again, a process. We're looking honestly at how boards do their work. And, and it's, it's important to keep in mind that this is a self-assessment. So it's looking at uh, boards looking at themselves and to do that in a way that's open and honest and rather than defensive. You don't know what you're going to find until you start to look. Uh, but if you look with an open mind and, and are willing to see the whole picture, um, you'll see some positives and you may see a few negatives. Um, that's the real value to this. You get a complete picture. Um, it's a conscious effort, uh, which is not the key point. It, it doesn't happen like automatically. You have to really do it with consciousness, with intention. And it's based on the belief that self-awareness is the first step. And we know this in, in, as, as, as people, as human beings. If you want to improve yourself as a person, you been, begin by taking a look at yourself um, and, and getting a handle on who you are, what matters to you, um, and how you can uh, kind of improve the way you live your life. So they're real similarities. 
board self-assessments too, you know, what we're going to talk about today is, is something that's more comprehensive and formal. But there are many, many ways to, uh, in an ongoing way, to continually assess your board's performance. Why do this? Uh, one way you do it, again, is kind of obvious. It's to measure your effectiveness. So you're going to get a picture of really what you do well as a board. It gives board members and the board as a whole an opportunity to reflect and, and to really clarify roles and responsibilities. Um, it's really important to take the time to do that, and a self-assessment is a helpful way to do it. Um, you measure progress, um, you know, various goals you set for yourself as a board of directors. It's a way to really do that measuring. The self-assessment tool that I use, there's a, um, there's a lot of uh, space for comments and for qualitative data, but there's also ways to quantify and to, and to actually uh, add numerical scores or, or attach numerical scores to various areas of governance. It's a way to identify strengths and weaknesses I mentioned earlier. It's a way to foster growth and development in individual board members. You know, very often when I do board self-assessments, and, and I should tell you I've done well over 100 of them, that very often board members will look at some of the questions and they'll ask themselves, like, oh, are we supposed to be doing this? And um, there's a lot of things that boards simply don't know um, they ought to be doing or could be doing, and this is a way to bring some of those to the surface. Identify different opinions and perceptions of board members. You know, I think that when I look around at boards that are functioning at a very high level, there's a diversity of opinions and perceptions sitting around the table. Um, and to identify those and to find a way to, to, to harness those differences and bring them to bear uh, on common issues, um, that's what this process is about. Highlight areas of governance where you can change or clarify. These are areas where you can make improvements. You do this because it increases your level of engagement and leadership among board members. People get involved in this. It's, it's, when you ask people what they think, they often will tell you. Um, reaffirm or redefine your mission or your values. Uh, provide an opportunity to restructure the board. Provide credibility within the board and with staff and funding sources. Build trust and respect and communication among board members. Um, these are lots of good reasons why you would do this. Promote teamwork among board members as well. These are really lots, just a list of, of the why, why it would be a good idea to do this. Um, I'm not sure where I got this quote, but when a board, what a board says about itself is taken much more seriously than when somebody from outside comes in and tells you things. Uh, so this really is about a board saying, this is the way we see the way we perform. These are the areas we think we do well. These are the areas where we think we can make improvements. When is it worth doing? I mean, when, are, when is it worth doing? In some ways, it's, it's um, we ask the question, are there times in an organization's life when it might be particularly good to do this? Well, there, there are some times. Um, when things are not quite in sync, it's a good time to do this. When the board and the organization are a little bit kind of unaligned and need to kind of um, step back and take a look at what's the board's job and how is the board doing its job. Uh, when the board's managing more than governing, if you're, uh, and I believe there's quite a few execs on this call, but you know, one of the common complaints of executives is, is either their board is not engaged or the board is like overly involved in managing their organization. Boards will often get into managing when they don't know how to govern. Um, if boards, in my experience, when boards learn to be effective governing bodies, then they stay out of the management part of the organization. When the board is asking or is increasingly being asked by staff for more involvement, when people are looking for ways to get more engaged. If you're considering reorganizing your board, um, one of the trends in the, in, the, in the nonprofit sector now is that boards are getting smaller and they're organizing their work a little differently than they have in the past. So if your board is considering some, some important kind of reorganization or restructuring, doing a self-assessment will be a good way to begin that process. And in preparation for any major organizational expansion, uh, you know, if you do anything major, it's, it's always a good idea to start with what you have right now in terms of your board and, um, and how it's working and how it can work better. Part of a strategic planning process, a lot of times I'll do board retreats that, that begin with the board doing a self-assessment um, and, and the board looking at its performance and then incorporating that into a strategic planning process. So it really connects very neatly to the strategic planning. Um, 
I think these are kind of, you know, when you're having problems with your board, that's a good time to do it. When things are going well, that's a good time to do it also. Uh, sometimes when you have a lot of conflict or, or, you know, and things are just out of whack, a board self-assessment is a good tool uh, because it, what it does is it takes a lot of the issues that might be emotionally charged and simply puts them out in front of folks. It, it, it kind of takes all that out of things and simply asks some questions about how do you think we're doing, how can we improve? Um, if there's been a leadership crisis, it's a good time to kind of, a good way to regroup um, a, as a board is to do an assessment. And also, when too much time has passed without having done one, I can tell you that uh, I work with many boards who do a board self-assessment, a very comprehensive assessment, every two or three years. And when they first start out doing that, they get a good picture of where they're working well and where they need to improve. And then over time, they develop kind of a, that's their baseline, and then they can see kind of trend lines as they go forward, as they improve their performance as a board. Thoughts or comments about anything I've said so far? I've been kind of rambling away here. A lot of information. If you'd like to say something, please remember to unmute. Okay, well, let me talk for a minute about how you go about doing this. So, so far we talked about reasons why and when it might be a good time. Now we'll talk about um, how the whole process works. So the first decision is obviously to decide you're going to do it. Um, that's, that's the big one, to simply say we should come together as a board and take an honest look at how we do our work and look at ways to improve wherever we could improve. Um, Often boards will assign the responsibility to a task force, but sometimes a full board would take the lead on it. Uh, sometimes the executive director is one who takes the lead. It, it really varies, but you want to make sure there's at least one person who is going to make sure they carry the ball forward. Decide whether or not to use an external consultant, and I'll talk in a minute about how you might think about that and make decisions about that. But it's an important part of the process as well. You can do this, as I said, informally or formally. You can bring somebody in from the outside or you can do it on your own. Uh, there's no right or wrong about it. Determine the process you're going to use and the timeline. Um, it's, in some ways, if you have experience evaluating uh, employees' performances, um, you might think about this in a similar way. You have a beginning and an end, uh, you know, a timeline for that. You don't drag it out. Uh, you do it in a quick enough time, but not, you don't rush it. Decide what tool you're going to use or design your own tool. I've, I've probably done 80 or 90 board self-assessments with a, with a tool that, that's the board source tool, which is the tool that is, in my opinion, most comprehensive. It's been tested. It's a, it's a valid tool. It works really well. It, gets, it does the job. Um, I've also worked with lots of organizations where they designed their own tool. So deciding what tool you might use or designing your own tool is another step in this process. And then you conduct the assessment. Once you conduct the assessment, what you actually do is to collect all the data. So you ask folks to answer questions, look at these various criteria, uh, and uh, give scores and, uh, and make comments. You conduct that assessment, and then you compile it all. And if, if I were working with your board, I would then kind of present a report to you. So that would be a way of saying, here's an interpretation of the data. This is what the data seems to be saying. And then from that, you determine your next step. So now we have the data. The data suggests that we do A, B, and C well, that we could really improve in X, Y, and Z. So let's come up with a plan for where we want to focus and if we want to improve on X, Y, and Z. So that, in a sense, are kind of the steps you would go through. Um, the question about an external consultant often comes up. and, and um, you know, I think there's three basic reasons why you, would act, why you would bring in a consultant. There's three reasons you might bring someone like me in. One is because um, you're getting objectivity. I'm not a member of your board. I'm not a member of your organization. I'm somebody from the outside who has no vested interest in the results. Um, my interest in working with any organization is to help that organization make good decisions for itself. So I get object, you get objectivity. 
you get experience. You get you get somebody um, who's done a lot of this before, and they bring a wealth of experience, and you get expertise. Um, so when you think about what you can, um, what can uh, an external consultant offer? In a nutshell, those are the three things: objectivity, experience, and expertise. Um, there's some efficiency ex uh, external consultants bring because they've done this before. The the, sur the um, assessment tool that I use through BoardSource is an online tool. People can do that at any time, at any pace, from anywhere in the world, um, and it's and it's very it's made as easy as possible to get everyone on your board to participate. A consultant can really translate the results into action, and that's what you want to end up when you do a self-assessment. You want to not just get a sense of the picture, but you want to come up with a plan for how are we going to make these changes so we can improve our performance. Um, conducting the survey, you know, that's again, I, the survey I use as a self-assessment uh, questionnaire for the most part. Uh, a lot of times the process might involve interviewing folks on the board. Um, there's a whole range of ways to do it, but, um, you know, having an external consultant, that's the person who can do all that work for you. Develop a comprehensive report. This is what I mentioned earlier. It's the, the kind of interpretation of the data. What does the data tell you? Um, facilitates a fast-paced and focused board discussion or retreat. Bringing somebody who, who's looked at the data and interpreted it and presents a report to you can then facilitate a discussion about that and help the board to determine, so what does all this information mean to us? And ensures a high level of participation, confidentiality, and objectivity. I mean, those are the kind of um, values that an external consultant can bring. And again, I'm not at all plugging you should use external consultants, and I'm certainly not advertising for myself here. I'm simply saying it's a consideration to bring in an external consultant, and if you decide to do that, it should be a, an informed decision. If you decide to not do that, it should be an informed decision as well. Any thoughts or comments about um, about external consultants or anything else we've talked about so far? Okay, and remind you too that if you want to just type in a question you can do that or a comment, you can do that as well in the chat box. So what's the difference here? What's the results? What's the impact? What's going to happen as a result of doing this? Um, and I've seen this in doing many board self-assessments. There's a renewed commitment and engagement on the part of board members. People get re-energized again. Um, they develop new skills and abilities simply by going through the process. You get a stronger uh, sense of direction for the board. The board gets clear about what its roles and responsibilities are and where it wants to go in guiding the organization. Clarifies roles and responsibility. It's something that's kind of an ongoing piece of work, I think, and, and I know when I first got involved with the urban programs, um, that work was all about trying to sort out what's the board's job and what's the staff's job and what are all those responsibilities boards should be doing and should be honoring. Um, it's an ongoing kind of thing. Strengthen the goals and contributions of board committees. I mean, it gives you a chance to look at the way you structure your committees. Uh, it can really change and, and, and look at committees that perhaps you want to disband and perhaps you need to create a committee you don't have. And then get um, board members' expectations up in a good way. Um, people come on to boards for, because they really want to make a difference. So you have some expectations about making a difference. Uh, having a sense of purpose is like a critical part of that. It's also a way to identify people on the board who are really not engaged and not participating. Uh, I've done, many of the board assessments I've done, the, the response rates have been um, in the very high numbers, 85, 90. Many of them are 100% response. Every single board member has an opportunity to respond, uh, and many do. But in some cases, you may have a 50 or 60% response rate. And if you have a low response rate, that could be an indication that there are some people that just are no longer engaged. It's a good way to orient new board members because it really, uh, as you'll see in a few minutes, it lays out all those aspects of governing that many new board members aren't, aren't aware of or aren't as fully aware of as they could be. So, so those are the kind of results you get. We take a minute, and what I'd like to do is to, is to talk about the elements those components of a board self-assessment tool. 
And the tool that I use and the one I'm referring to today divides the board's work down into roles and responsibilities. So the board's role is in setting direction and ensuring that there are adequate resources to, to advance the mission, to serve the people in the community that you serve, to provide oversight. So it's another role of the board. Oversight means to make sure that your, uh, your finances are in order, that your books are audited on a regular basis. Uh, oversight means evaluating the performance of the executive director. Oversight means making sure your programs are really high quality and research-based, uh, culturally competent, uh, all those kind of oversight roles. And then the structure and the operations of the board. So those are like the, the roles fall into those four broad categories. The areas of responsibility fit these roles. So in terms of setting direction, the responsibilities have to do with the mission, developing it, refining it, making sure that everything you do is aligned with your mission. Strategy, making sure that there's a plan in place that positions your organization um, so it's in good shape when all these different changes come down the pike. And it's particularly critical for healthcare um, organizations given all the changes going on in the healthcare field right now. So you can see that the setting the direction in terms of role, these are the responsibilities. In terms of ensuring resources, that has to do with making sure that as a board member, that the public knows who your organization is, what it does, why it does it, why it's important. You're kind of the ambassador for the organization, and that helps ensure resources, and advocacy work helps ensure resources. The composition of the board, um, people who serve on the board, those are your human resources. Those are the governors, the owners of the organization. Responsibilities around program oversight, financial oversight, and chief executive oversight. As I mentioned earlier, those, those are the kind of responsibilities that fall under the, the oversight role. And then in terms of board structure and operations, you look at the structure of the board and your meetings, how you, how you do your meetings, how you plan them, how you execute them. As uh, someone mentioned earlier, they've begun evaluating their meeting. Um, and I, you probably heard me say this, but if you evaluate your board meeting and you do a good job of evaluating that board meeting, the very next meeting is going to be better, and you set in motion a really positive upward spiral. So in a sense, if you look at these elements of a board self-assessment tool, you're going to have those four roles, and nested within those roles, you're going to have these nine areas of responsibility. So that's one major part of a board self-assessment. So there will be questions or criteria that have to do with the board's work around mission, and around strategy, uh, all those different responsibilities. There's also, in the assessment tool that I use, a, a, a practice areas checklist. And I, left, I put some examples here. So this is a, a, these are like checkoffs, so questions about what's currently in place. So for example, a question would be, is there a written strategic plan? And that has to do with organizational practices. Now if you're doing a board self-assessment and you're looking at the forum and you come to that question, if there is no strategic plan, you check no. That simply says to everyone, wow, we don't have a plan, maybe we should get one. Oversight practice is the same kind of thing, and I put an example there. Uh, you have an annual budget. The, the full board should approve that budget. If your full board doesn't approve the annual budget, you want to know that. You, wa you want board members to say to each other, we don't do this, and maybe we should. Board practice, I use this example here, is there a formal orientation for new board members? It simply asks the question, do you have that in place? Uh, if you have it in place, that's great. Then the next question would be, how do we improve upon it? If you don't have it in place, then the next question would be, how do we get one in place? Uh, and the chief executive supervision. Is the, the chief executive evaluated annually by the board, and does the whole board participate in that? So those are the kind of uh, second part of this whole tool is that these uh, checklist practices. Then there's also uh, some other parts to the tool, and I'm, again, I'm referring to a tool that I use that's really the most comprehensive. Um, there's, there's places for written comments. So, so if we go back to those nine roles and responsibilities, uh, there are written comments in each of those sections. There's a place for written comments. Um, we also look at the, the demographic data of the organization. So for example, uh, questions in organizational uh, demographics would be something like how many, um, 
what's the attendance? What's the average attendance at a board meeting? How often does your board meet? Um, those are kind of examples of the demographics. Uh, how long has the executive director been in that position? Um, those kind of demographic um, data. And then there's also in the tool that I use and we're a place where individual board members would actually assess their own individual performance. And so that's why I talk about this being a comprehensive tool. It looks at the board collectively in its performance. It looks at individual board members as well. The board members, where, how they see themselves performing as individual board members. So those are the elements. Those are the kind of components to this. Um, again, you've got the kind of roles and responsibilities. You've got a checklist of practices. You've got the, uh, the written comments, the organizational demographics, and the individual board member assessments. Do you have any comments or questions or thoughts about the components of a self-assessment tool? Um, this is Gina um, from Santa Barbara. One of the things that I'm thinking, you were talking about when do you do uh, an assessment, and mm -hmm. you know, I think we were getting more into the team building, and we started discussing um, you know, what, what are some of the things that we need? What are some of the skills we need right now? We have a small board. We're just six of us. And what are some of the skills we need? And we need to add a couple members with medical backgrounds and financial backgrounds, but we've approached people and they've turned us down. And we're trying to figure out, you know, how do we enhance some of our own skills if we can't get what we want? And, um, so we're kind of trying to figure out how do we work better as a team and enhance some of the missing skills if that's what we need to do. Um, and so I'm also thinking of how do we assess, you know, ourselves as some of the things we're doing or not doing, and we still need to be looking for additional board members that enhance what we don't have, but how do we look at ourselves to learn what we don't have too? So, and then we well, also have you know, a member that's not attending. That's another issue. But no, uh, well, a couple of comments I'll make. One going from the back, from the end, and going forward, which is the way I tend to do things. When you have somebody who is not attending, um, to do nothing will simply reinforce non attendance. So the board has to kind of ask itself the question: What is it about us that's causing this person to? To simply not engage with us. Maybe, you know, maybe this person. Maybe we weren't clear when we uh, when we uh, recruited this person that we expected them to show up and to and to involve themselves. Um, you know, maybe our meetings are so boring that they don't want to come. I don't know what the reasons would be, but you always want to begin with yourself first. Uh, mm -hmm. And again, that's same with the self-assessment. So asking yourself, so is there any way we might be part of this attendance problem? There may be, and there may not be, but it's the, it's a good starting point. Yeah. One of the things that I find out of about state and doesn't want to, the person moved out of state and doesn't want to withdraw from the board is kind of what happens. So. Oh, well, you know, um, you yeah, I mean, can't, can't drive to the meeting. So, if a person can't stay engaged some way and bring value, then they're simply taking up space, and they they need to. Often, they buy, I don't know what your bylaws look like, but often bylaws will be written in such a way that if somebody misses a certain number of meetings, then a vacancy is created. Or if, if somebody doesn't show up for so many meetings, we'll, we'll assume that that means they have resigned. Um, but you, you know, I think that it's important that, um, and especially with a small board, you can't have people not showing up and doing the and kind of pulling their share of the load. Um, you really need people so you can share the responsibility. Um, another quick comment, and that is that I, what I see is that you talked about trying to recruit some folks and they said no. Um, and that may or may not be a bad thing. Um, you know, if people are really very busy or are not sure how they're going to really make a difference on your board, then a no is probably a good response. Um, if they say no because they don't have confidence in your board, then you have to do something about building confidence. Um, often what I find is that people, um, when you ask folks to serve on a board, they, to ask them to serve on a board is not as helpful as to ask them to do something specifically. So for example, if your urban program 
uh, does great programming, provides great services, and people in the community don't even know you exist, you may decide, well, we want to get visible. We want to make sure everybody knows who we are. And then you look around the boardroom and you realize, gee, there's nobody on our board that has kind of marketing or public relations skills, so let's go find someone. And when you find that person, you don't ask them to simply come on the board. You ask them to come on and help you advance this goal. Come on the board. It's a two-year term. And what we need you to do, the way you can bring real value to our board and our organization, is to help put us on the map so the community knows we're here and that we do good work. That's just kind of an example. Okay. Um, but you know, I think I think you know, and I kind of use that as an example. I mean, that's 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 recruiting people strategically. Um, if you want a medical doc on your board, the question that comes to my mind is, how is a medical doctor going to bring value to your board? It may be because they have some expertise in medicine, maybe because they're a medical doctor and they're highly regarded in the community. Um, there are a lot of different ways in which a medical doctor can bring value. Sometimes a medical doctor brings real value because they happen to be a creative thinker and that their real value is that they bring some creativity to the board, not necessarily medical expertise, even though they have that. See what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. People bring, uh, bring value that goes way beyond these roles that we define. People always talk about, you know, we need somebody from healthcare, we need a, 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 somebody with financial expertise and so on. Uh, and you do need those skills, but you're bringing on a person, and it's a whole person. And, um, you know, recruiting people to your board is very similar to hiring people. So if you have any practice or experience in hiring folks, you take the skills you have around hiring employees and transfer them to the extent you can to the extent you can to recruiting um, board members. There's a lot of good material, by the way, around recruiting and board development stuff in these webinars. Um, mo uh, most of them we've covered already, but those are archived now, and you can access those and look over that material. And again, I would invite you all if you have any comments or specific questions about stuff or want some resources, I can I can get my hands on a lot of stuff for you. Okay. Other thoughts or comments? So when you think about this, when we talk about how um, doing board self-assessments is a good thing, it's a healthy thing, it's something you know we want to encourage people to do, why is it that so few boards do it? What are the obstacles? What are the things to get in the way of boards saying, let's get serious about this, let's look at how we perform with the, with the intention of improving our practices? What are the things that come to your mind? What will, what are the things perhaps in your organization that, that seem to be obstacles that need to be overcome? What gets in the way of this happening? What are the kind of things that get in the way for you all? Well, let me share a couple. Let me share a couple with you that I see. One that I see as an obstacle why boards don't do this is ignorance, and I don't mean that in a disrespectful or negative kind of way. By ignorance, I mean boards simply do not know. They are not aware. They don't have the idea that this would be a good thing. They don't. They simply don't know. It's not in their. It's not in their consciousness. Um, and that's one of those obstacles that's easy to overcome. Um, in, in some ways, that's what this webinar is about. It's saying, here is a self-assessment. Here is when you might think about doing it. Here is what, how it can have value for you. Um, this is what it looks like. Um, now you can make a conscious decision. Well, do we want to do one or not? And if you decide not to, well, you're no, you're no longer in the, uh, in the ignorance range. You're in a knowledgeable range, but you made an informed decision to not do it. So ignorance, not knowing, is one of the major obstacles. Another obstacle that I see is the resistance to change. Just like all of us as, as individual human beings, when, when we take time to step back and look at our lives and ask a question, what can I do to be a better person, sometimes it requires you have to change what you've been doing. And there's a resistance to, changing, uh, uh, to change. It's just there, but it's just a natural kind of thing. So that's another obstacle. And so, you know, in my experience, when boards understand that 
you know, this may lead to some changes, but it's going to be for the, the good of the community we serve and, and, and our patients. Um, you know, and that change is something that's inevitable, and either you can control it or it's going to control you. But try to find ways to kind of overcome that kind of a resistance. Some boards simply don't want to take an honest look at themselves. And we all know that there are some human beings who don't seem to want to or not able to really just look at themselves honestly. Uh, it takes a lot of courage, in my experience, for a board to say, let's take an honest look at ourselves, just like it takes a lot of courage for an individual person to say, you know, I'm going to really step back and take a look at my life and see what I see. Um, it takes a lot of courage because you don't know what you're going to find. Um, but it's an important first step because once you can kind of take an honest look at yourself, then you can decide if you want to do something about it. And another obstacle, perhaps the fourth obstacle that, that, uh, that I see, is that sometimes boards don't do this because there's, there's a cost to it. And um, I will just share a couple of comments with that. Um, whenever we think about cost, if we're not thinking about value, we're only thinking about it halfway. <laughs> um, you have to always factor in not only what does something cost, but what's the value to that. Um, so it's not just thinking about it in terms of money. It's thinking about it in terms of what are we going to get for this money? Which, which, how is this going to make a difference? Um, I've done board self-assessments where boards have done the online, online self-assessment. I've come and spent two or three days with the board in a retreat. Um, they do action plans. Uh, and they invest a pretty substantial chunk of money in this. I've also worked with boards where they kind of do it on their own. They pay some money for a good tool. And they do it themselves. They volunteer. Um, they may have somebody uh, on the board who has some expertise and can help with it. Um, there are all kinds of variations to how you might do this. Um, money, uh, money is an obstacle, but it shouldn't be a deal breaker. If it's important enough for you to improve your performance, then find a way to generate the revenues you need so that you can actually do that. And also to not do it in, in a way that you over-engineer things. You don't need to spend $10,000 to do a board self-assessment. You can, you can spend a couple of thousand dollars and have an absolutely comprehensive self-assessment of a board where every board member is engaged. You get a good product at the end, a good plan, an action plan. People are energized. Things change uh, for the good. So you can do that. It doesn't take a lot of money, but it does take some money. Um, and, you know, and it's the way, that's the way things are. But in my mind, those are some examples of what I see as obstacles, um, why boards simply don't do this. Um, and if you think about it, if, if a board or enough people on a board uh, learn about the value of this, come to accept that we might make some changes, but the changes are going to be good for us and for, our, and for the people we serve, um, and that it really requires us to just be able to look at ourselves honestly, and then we need to raise a little money to do it. Uh, these are all easily surmountable obstacles. Um, so those are my thoughts on that, on obstacles. So um, let me just kind of recap what we talked about and leave you a few minutes at least if you have other questions or comments. But we started this session really looking at this idea of self-assessment, what it is, why you would do it, how it could have some real value to you, um, when would be a good time to do it, what are some of the parts or the components of a self-assessment tool and process, um, and we looked at the things that might get in the way of moving forward on this. So in a nutshell, that kind of recaps everything that we've been talking about for the past hour. Um, I invite you, your comments, your questions. If you if, remember to unmute your phone. If you do have some questions or comments or suggestions, uh, anything, if you'd like to reach out to me after this call, please feel free to do that. You have my email address. There it is. Um, please feel free to do that. Uh, as I said, you'll also be getting uh, a, a Survey Monkey, an online survey. If you could complete that and give us your, your honest feedback, that will help us improve our work 
Uh, and if you have ideas about future uh, webinars, please make sure you put them down there because we will look at those and we'll see if we can develop some new ones. Um, the next webinar is going to be on um, on November 19th at 1 o'clock. It's a Monday, uh, 1 o'clock East, East Coast time. And what we're going to do there is to really look at the characteristics of boards that perform at a very high level. So we're going to look at like outstanding, you know, outstanding, the Michael Jordans of, of boards. <laughs> we're going to look at the absolute best performing boards. We're going to look at the characteristics of those boards. And folks who participate will then be able to kind of use that as a benchmark and look at the way your board performs in these different areas and compare and contrast. In some ways, it's, it's going to seem like a little bit of an assessment. Um, and also, I think it will lead to some new ideas uh, around effective governance practices. So that's what's coming up next on the 19th, and you can register for that like you've done through here. And I would invite you to invite as many people you know who you think might benefit to kind of join you. You can join on a conference call in someone's office, um, so you don't have to all be on your individual phones. There are a lot of ways to connect here, but I would invite you all to do that. Um, I thank you for your participation. Um, wish you all a good afternoon, and again, feel free to contact me anytime. So uh, good afternoon to everyone. Before you finish, Tony, may I please yep. invite everyone to click on the triangle next to chat and if your chat window is not open, there is a departing message that contains the link to the online survey. And that link will also be sent out following this session via email. Perfect. Thank you so much, Philip. So that's easy to do, folks. Take you a few minutes, and your input is valued. So please do respond. Thank you all again. Have a good afternoon. Thank you. Good questions or okay, thank you. Thank you.